Hello? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask all the opening session speakers to please come and sit in front. I think we are missing two of them. Um, just by your nameplates. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the hosts. I think this is one of the most efficient opening ceremonies. We started before time and we finished before time as well. I mean, it has never happened before. Uh, we usually are late, so um, this is really great. So we're about to start the opening session where we're going to have speeches by some of our stakeholders. So if you could please um, take your seats. And let me see if I see everybody. Yes. Um, okay. And not to be outdone by our hosts, I think we will just um start if you could take your seats please Okay, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, welcome to the opening session of IGF 2023, our 17th IGF. Uh, so without much further ado, let me please call on our first speaker, Ms. Doreen Bogdan-Martin, the ITU Secretary General-Elect. Please. Hello. Okay, I think that's better. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's exciting to be back in, in Africa, the continent where the IGF was born and where the potential of digital transformation to drive growth and prosperity is nowhere greater. Thinking about the many challenges that face us today, I was reminded about the words of the former UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan, at the first World Summit on the Information Society. He reminded each and every one of us that we have an active role to play in the digital transformation that's reshaping our world. Technology has produced the information age, he said. Now, it's up to all of us, all of us, to build an information society. This year's IGF comes at a watershed moment for governments searching for ways to connect their citizens, for the tech sector currently experiencing its own forms of disruption, and for the UN system as it prepares to negotiate a global agreement, setting out a shared vision of what digital needs to deliver for we, the peoples. The Global Digital Compact envisages an open, free, inclusive, and secure digital future for all. That's a bold vision. It's a bold vision in a world where one third of humanity has never ever connected to the internet. And it's a bold vision 
in a world where risks associated with digital technologies are multiplying and they require global collaborative solutions. Yes, it's an ambitious vision, but it's a vision that we absolutely need to embrace. We need to embrace it as a global community because not to do so would mean squandering, squashing the greatest opportunity that humanity has ever had to create a fairer, more prosperous and more inclusive world for all. Digital technology is a uniquely powerful enabler. Through digital, we can put life-changing power, the life-changing power of education in the hands of all. We can empower the socially and economically disadvantaged. We can ensure that everyone everywhere has access to healthcare. We can turbocharge human knowledge through collaboration in science, engineering, agriculture, and more. Ladies and gentlemen, it's clear that we will never attain the SDGs, those 17 SDGs, without the power of ICTs. And so as we approach the 2030 target, let me ask you, how will future generations judge us if we fail to use the tools, if we fail to use the tools that are so readily available to build a better future for all? Last year at this conference, I urged us to embrace the theme of Internet united and to think about our digital future as one community. The recent ITU Plenipotentiary Conference in the same vein urged us to connect and unite. This is what the Global Digital Compact aspires to do. With its global reach and mandate, the United Nations is the right place to come together and to forge a shared vision for our digital future. And as the UN Agency for Digital Technologies, ITU, with its unique membership of governments, the private sector, civil society, can mobilize the broader digital community and help to bring all voices to the table. Our collaborative culture and the relationships that we've established are all resources that the UN family can draw upon to deliver universal, affordable, meaningful, and resilient connectivity for all. And of course, a durable global digital compact that delivers on this vision. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you were present at the WISIS, at the Tunis phase of the WISIS? I see at least one of them right here, Vince Cerf. <laughs> Others, I was, one in the back. <laughs> my friend from Turkey as well, um, and I know many others, I think, that are following online were also, were also there. It was there that, at least I remember, the spirit of optimism that was demonstrated, the international goodwill that really characterized the summit. And of course, now, 20 years later, we find ourselves at another inflection point. The networks and services that we shaped collectively through digital cooperation are now, in turn, reshaping our world. We have a duty to future generations to guide that evolution and to ensure that the outcomes are beneficial and not destructive. So that people are empowered by the positive potential of technology rather than cowered by its dark side. So let me close by returning once again to, to the words of, of Kofi Annan. While technology shapes the future, he said, it is people, it is people who shape technology and decide what it can and what it should be used for. We, the international community, have an opportunity and we have an obligation to work together to forge a digital future where access to fast, safe 
inclusive, and affordable internet is a given and not a privilege. I look forward to taking this journey with all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, ITU Secretary General elect. Now I would like, I won't move the mic because then everybody will be moving it down. <laughs> um, now I'd like to call upon Mr. Tofik Jelassi, Assistant Director General for Communication and Information, UNESCO. Thank you. Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, let me first start answering Doreen Bogdan Martin's question. Yes, I was at the 2005 World Summit on the Information Society. And as we all know, Tunisia hosted that year the World Summit on the Information Society, which was the birthplace of the IGF. So I come from North Africa, and I'm very delighted being here in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Ethiopia, as the representative of the UNESCO Director General at this important event. UNESCO has been very much involved in the IGF since its start. UNESCO has even hosted the 2018 edition of the IGF at its Paris headquarters. We continue our work with the IGF stakeholders, including through our Internet Universality Indicators and the UNESCO Rome X framework. For those of you who are not familiar with it, let me define the four key letters in Rome. R standing for human rights, O for open, A for accessible, and M for multi-stakeholder approach to digital development and to internet usage. We recognize that the internet and digital technologies are the backbone of digital transformation, a topic that His Excellency the Prime Minister emphasized in his opening remarks. But there is no successful digital transformation. It's not anchored in human rights and other key humanistic values, a message that Doreen emphasized in her opening remarks. So there are three key questions in this digital transformation journey that I think we should all answer. Why to transform? What to transform? and how to transform. I think the case for change, the why, is quite obvious to all of us, but what is not as easy to answer is what are the boundaries of digital transformation and how to execute, how to implement, how to deploy. Again, our Rome X approach, which is very much cross-cutting in terms of topics, including gender equality, including climate change, and the 303 indicators that we have developed to conduct a national assessment of digital readiness. We are delighted to say that so far, 44 countries have used the UNESCO Rome framework and internet universality indicators, 17 of which are African nations. Actually, it was just last week that Ethiopia released its report on the national digital assessment through the UNESCO framework and indicators. We live in an era where digital platforms are becoming dominant. We know in many countries the youth spending more than a couple of hours per day connecting to digital platforms. We know in some countries, the primary source of news for 80% of the population is a digital or social media platform. The Prime Minister mentioned some of the key public hazards in that. 
disinformation, misinformation, hate speech online, conspiracy theories, cyberbullying, online harassment of professionals, and so on and so forth. That's not the resilient, open, accessible internet that we all want. We don't want the internet to become a place for public hazard. We don't want the internet to become a place for public harm. We want an internet where information is ensured to be a public common good. How can we go about that? I am pleased to announce that UNESCO is organizing next February a global conference on regulating digital platforms to ensure information is a public good while safeguarding freedom of expression online. When I say regulating digital platforms, I do not meet I don't mean censoring digital platforms. That's why I added how to regulate digital platforms to ensure information is a public good and not a public hazard while safeguarding freedom of speech. We have been preparing for this major conference in an inclusive multi-stakeholder approach involving the 193 member states of UNESCO, civil society, academia, research institutions, but also, very important stakeholder, the technology companies and the digital platform operators, without which our declaration will remain just a paper exercise. It is the technology companies and the digital platform operators who have to abide by the global regulatory principles that will be the outcome of this conference. Of course, we don't mean to be a substitute to national regulat regulatory bodies, but we want to come up with is a global model for regulation of digital platforms accepted by all stakeholders involved. Let me just conclude by saying UNESCO will continue to work closely with other members of the UN family, with different stakeholders, be it civil society, academia, private sector, research institutions. We are pleased to continue the discussions regarding the World Summit on the Information Society, plus 20 review, the future of the IGF, and hopefully to contribute to the Global Digital Compact, but also to the UN Summit for the Future of September 2024. Let me here quote, in closing, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who said, there are two key challenges that we are facing in the 21st century, climate change and digital transformation. Certainly, we can hopefully contribute to the solutions or sustainable solutions for both key challenges. I wish you a fruitful IGF. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Assistant Director General. Our next speaker, uh, representing our IGF youth speakers, will be Ms. Lily Edinam Botsea. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, um, colleagues, Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lily Edina Mboche, and I coordinate the Ghana Youth Internet Governance Forum. Today, I represent the youth and youth voices across the world, a group that is by far um, the largest users of the internet and actively um, contributing to building its core. I can see a couple of young people around, and if you're youth or youth at heart, you can just give away. Right, I can see a couple of us, that is really cool. So I especially want to commend the IGF Secretariat's um, effort led by Anya Gengo and the staunch um, involvement of several young people and youth groups across the world for this year's IGF Youth Track and the work that has been uh, put in the process to be able to organize sessions across the globe um, in, the, in Eurodig, in the African IGF, in the Asia Pacific region and also in the Latin American region. This year was all inclusive and had many people being represented and we are super proud of what we've been able to achieve. 
Our discussions have uh, focused on opportunities for digital transformation, challenges and steps to achieve better digital future. Though the dynamics of um, our youth engagement is gradually changing, many young people um, in rural areas and remote communities are still not included in the debate around internet governance and just um, generally in technology policy space. Many are constrained by poverty, unemployment, and other social and economic marginalization. Additionally, digital threats and risks are constantly increasing. There are multiple challenges um, preventing youth from fully benefiting from digital transformation. And notable amongst these are the cost of connectivity, um, internet shutdowns, and then digital illiteracy. The changes we seek can be attained by rethinking ideas like youth and newbies are inexperienced and probably will only benefit from capacity building sessions. And we have to move this from this thought to the shift in seeing young people or recognizing us for the expertise we bring on board and the creation of the space for us to have discussions around issues that matter to us and where our particular needs are met. Again, considering the possibility of decentralized funding and supporting models from the private sector and other organizations may be the future of meaningful participation for youth in internet governance. We have a report that will be shared at the closing probably and also made available for our action oriented points um, that have come from the discussions we've had over the weeks and months um, building up to this conference. The future of a secure, robust and open internet is inherently a matter of youth who are at the forefront developing its core. We are poised to build mutual understanding between stakeholders um, in the internet community in order to make better policies. Towards building an internet for all, young people are ready to get involved. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lily. Our next speaker does not need any introduction. I would like to call Mr. Vince Cerf chair of the IDF leadership panel, and also one of the fathers of the internet. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jengitani. You know, when people clap before you have said anything, it probably is a good time to just sit down because it won't get any better than that. I, I really appreciated Lily's remarks, oh, to be young again. Distinguished excellencies in attendance and remotely, I join my fellow speakers in gratitude for the generosity of our hosts, the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, and equally great appreciation for Chengatai Masango and his IGF Secretariat, and the multi-stakeholder advisory group under the leadership of Paul Mitchell for their dedicated organization of this 17th annual Internet Governance Forum. The leadership panel acknowledges the charge from the UN Secretary General Guterres to engage productively with the MAG, the participants of the annual IGF, and with the participants of national and regional IGFs. Our aim is to amplify and facilitate the exposure of IGF outputs to other bodies relevant to the health and function of the internet and the ecosystem which it has created. The challenge before us is to realize the demonstrated and potential benefits of the internet now that we know that it can be both a productive environment and one in which material harms can be perpetrated. The world is looking at the IGF, its leadership panel, its MAG and the IGF participants to throw light in dark corners and highlight paths to successful use of the internet for all the world's internauts and the countries in which they live. We now know that among other important properties, accountability and agency are primary desiderata in the internet ecosystem. Our job 
is to articulate what are the desirable properties of that system. Safety, security, privacy, utility, accessibility in both senses of the word, affordability, resilience, operational sustainability, adaptability, and many more than I'm sure you can add. You will hear those words repeatedly in this conference, and you already have heard them several times this afternoon. Since the first World Summit on the Information Society, we have collectively admired the Internet's problems and its beneficial possibilities, and we have described them in some detail. It's time to start taking concrete steps to realize the system that we collectively want. To that end, in support of others working on digital cooperation and the Global Digital Compact, such as the UN Secretary General's Tech Envoy, the Leadership Panel is committed to offering concrete examples of actions that can lead to improvement in today's internet and more generally, the digital environment. I hope that the world of 2045 will look back at the work we've undertaken and be grateful for the work we do this week and in the years ahead. Let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vincent. <laughs> Our next speaker is Under Secretary General Mr. Amandeep Singh Gill, who is the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology. Well, Wint told us to just roll up our sleeves and get to work. And what am I doing here? Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Addis, uh, in uh, this beautiful city. Um, and it is a delight to see the IJF come back home to Africa. Uh, Tunis is where it all started, and Doreen started us uh, down the memory lane. And it's great that IJF is now coming back to Africa. And it's also great to see the growth of this community. Many more regional IGFs, many more national IGFs. So it's truly becoming uh, a community that's built from the bottom up. And it's also great to see its multi-stakeholder character come alive in all the sessions, all the different discussions that take place, uh, in the deliberations of uh, the MAG, the multi-stakeholder advisory group, and in the newly constituted IGF leadership panel, which Windsurf and Mariresa are uh, co-chairing. A lot has been achieved in 17 years. A lot more needs to be done. When the Secretary General started a reflection on digital cooperation in 2018, one of the key areas of focus was how do we reinforce the governance of digital technologies? Not just the internet itself, but the digital world writ large. In the years since, the importance of the digital transformation has been universally recognized. Uh, today, each and every UN agency has digital transformation and related issues as one of its top priorities. That's good to see. But I think we need to work harder on improve how we govern these technologies. The Internet Governance Forum itself needs to up its game. That's the reason why in the Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation, there was a focus on the IGF plus governance approach. And the leadership panel, which has had its first meetings uh, 
these past 24 hours uh, has its task cut out. You all have your task cut out uh, to make sure that this community, this vibrant community, which has achieved so much, is fit for purpose for the coming years. The challenges are many. The speakers before me have described some of those challenges. And in Africa in particular, there are three important priorities. One is simply connecting the unconnected. It's the hard work of building the physical infrastructure for digital connectivity. It's the hard work of bringing down costs of data. It's the hard work of building digital literacy, building content in local languages, building local data sets. And then that's not going to be enough. There will be a need to focus on another priority, which is the guardrails, the common rails that need to be there for inclusive participation in the digital economy. Today, digital public infrastructures, digital public goods are part of our vocabulary. But there are very few countries who have realized the power of digital public infrastructure. And we need to take that message to many, many more countries. How do we lower the entry barriers for participation in the digital economy, whether it is small startups or uh, an informal business that needs to do payments online. There are many, many areas of economic activity that can be facilitated through the wise use of digital public infrastructure, digital public goods in the form of these guardrails and common rails. The third priority area for Africa, and perhaps for most countries across the globe, is the data ecosystem. I hesitate to add artificial intelligence. It has become such a buzzword. But I think that will not happen if you don't have the data foundations. Uh, so which means data science capacity, human resource around data especially human resource at the junction of digital and other domains, agriculture and food security, health, the green transition mentioned as one of the two great transitions currently underway, the energy transition, addressing energy poverty uh, in Africa, building the smart grids of the future. So in those areas, we need to build the capacity, human capacity. We also need to build the data sets for the future. This is not a rich country problem. This is not a big tech problem. It is everyone's challenge. We need to make sure that Africa doesn't lag behind on the data and AI race. So we have to run these three races at the same time. And I'm sure uh, you'll be up to uh, the task. And this forum, this community uh, will support through knowledge exchange, uh, through uh, guidelines on uh, policy approaches through capacity development, uh, these uh, three priority areas. Finally, to conclude, I want to spend a few moments reflecting on the Global Digital Compact. The Secretary General, in his uh, message to this conference, has underlined why we need to reflect on an open, free, secure, and inclusive digital future for all. Uh, there are a number of reasons related to misuse, related to uh, the uh, abuse that we see online. My colleague from UNESCO mentioned all the challenges that we have there. But there is also the problem of missed opportunities. The SDGs agenda, Agenda 2030, uh, has had a setback uh, because of the COVID pandemic, the effects of uh, other shocks, geopolitical shocks, economic shocks, and we will not be able to catch up if we don't leverage the digital opportunity. But the question is, how do we actually do that? So the Global Digital Compact is an opportunity for us to harness that opportunity to also address the misuse, the risks associated with these technologies, particularly when we are on the cusp of moving to the next generation of intelligent networks, the Internet of Things, 
quantum computing, neural implants, and many, many other technologies which are founded in digital, but which are stretching beyond our current policy and governance frameworks. This process leading up to the Global Digital Compact in 2024 will be a multi-stakeholder process. Member states, of course, have the lead. They will have to negotiate this document. But all of you, the multi-stakeholder uh, communities from academia, from the private sector, from the tech sector, from civil society have a role to play, not only in bringing more nuance, more urgency, uh, and more factfulness to these policy discussion, but also in ensuring that once the compact is adopted, it's taken forward, it's implemented, its guidance is landed in the practice of not only governments, but also the private sector, uh, civil society, academia, and the technology networks. Uh, it's a huge task, uh, and we have made a good beginning. Uh, this uh, forum has five items on its agenda, uh, and those five items are closely aligned with the themes that the Global Digital Compact is likely to address. So the outcome of your deliberations uh, would be a crucial, crucial input into that process going into the summit of the future in 2024. I wish you all the very best for your deliberations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Under Secretary General Gill, and we look forward to submitting the outputs of this IGF into the Global Digital Compact uh, process. Our second last speaker is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, Mr. Joran Marby. Hello, everybody. It's, it's a problem to be one of the last distinguished speakers, not being that distinguished. So I thought I'm going to do it and actually listen to Wint then. Don't worry. The only thing I'm going to do is roll up my sleeves. I always do what Wint says. Funny enough, I was thinking about Wint a couple of just when I was preparing this speech because we were in a panel, IGF panel in Geneva. And at that panel, everybody suddenly talked about internet as a bad thing. It was all about fake news, the problems on the internet, etc., etc. And I remember me looking at each other, saying, "This is not the internet I know." So I will try to give you a little bit more of a positive picture of what's happening and happening in the world. But I also represent the technical community, so I'm going to be nerdy. But first of all, hello and welcome to the internet. Welcome to this room and welcome here. I'm really happy to be here. This is one of my favorite places to be. ICANN has been a supporter of the IGF since its start. And we do that because we think this is an important place for people, stakeholders, governments, civil society, and just people coming together and talk to each other. It's not the outcome important. I see this as a big school, and especially coming to Africa and, and learn so much about all the things that's happening here helps me and benefits me and my organization. But we shouldn't forget, the power of the internet comes from being one single, interoperable global resource that is accessible globally and locally at the same time. It brought us closer together because it is borderless and owned by no one and yet controlled by everyone. The internet is a network of networks that relies on this common set of technical protocols and standards that allows these networks to communicate with each other. So it's allowing us to interact these technical rules essentially ensure what we call interoperability, which is a crucial aspect of technology to ensure that it's accessible for everybody everywhere from a technical perspective. Every time you go online, you hit about something that comes from ICANN and from our technical partners. We do that for free. We do that for you. And how do we define the internet? The internet is used we have many different words to, to call the internet. So I'm from the technical community, so I'll make it simple. What do you do when you go online? Is you use three parts, what we call the DNA of the internet. The IP protocol, the DNS, and the IP addresses. If you don't use this, 
You're not on the internet anymore. Often, when you think you're on the internet, you might end ending up in someone's computer. You actually left the internet and going somewhere else. The internet is a system of trust. And this trust comes from a technical coordination governed by the multi-stakeholder model. Funny enough, it's voluntarily for you to use those parts of the DNA. You can actually choose to use something else. The funny thing is, five billion people have used to decided to use this technical DNA. And as long as everybody uses the same technical protocols, there will be one single global internet that knows no geographical borders whatsoever. And there's no single group or government or company that actually controls this. We have seen attempts by governments, we have seen attempts by companies, we have seen, for good reasons or bad reasons, the road to hell is paved with good intentions to take this over. So far, we've been able, with the help of you, to sustain the model we have, the core functioning of the internet. ICANN is a part of an internet ecosystem. I have some of my friends here from the ITF, uh, AIB, and other ones, and the RERs, who are actually part of this technical community, and I just humbly represent them. We work very closely together to give you the ability to the internet. And we've done that for a large part of 40 years. You never hear the internet went down, have you? you, you know, your operator might go down, your Wi-Fi might be taken over by your son, but you never hear the fact that the internet went down. And that is because it's designed by some very smart people to make sure it doesn't go down. What I understand is the last time we had a technical issue was 35 years ago. The, through the internet, through the multi-stakeholder model, we've been able to do this. And that's why I'm so happy to be here, to have those discussions, but also with other policymakers. We're not done. You might think that you go online and everything works. And I can bet you probably speak English. 80% of all the content on the internet and domain names and other things are actually in English. Less than 20% of all people in the world speaks English. Our next big generation change of the internet is to make internet accessible regardless of which language, which culture, which you come from, which, you, which, co uh, which keyboard you want to use, it's accessible to the internet. That's a really big thing, where I invite especially governments to help us in this effort as being a big buyer of IT equipment, which is really important to us. And on that note, on Thursday, we are proud to, and I hope you will join us, where we are going to launch something we call the Coalition for Digital Africa, where we're going to introduce more methods, especially here in Africa, to, for instance, to be able to support the more than 3,000 languages and scripts that exist only in Africa. I also want to thank uh, Doreen uh, in her previous role as the director of ITUD. Uh, together a couple of months ago, six or seven months ago, maybe longer, we made an announcement together that we'd in, uh, we're building the first, or have built, the first what we call the IMRS cluster, which you don't really know what it is, but I tell you, we did that in, in Kenya. We officially launched it two weeks ago. What we saw by us doing that investment, and we did that investment, we didn't ask anyone for money to do it, we saw that more of the internet traffic now stays in Africa. Why is that important? It increases the speed of the internet in Africa, at the same time increases the resiliency, but also the security of the system. How do we know this? That's why interactions were here from the IDF and other ones. This is where we meet. I thank you very much for my time and I rolled up my sleeve. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Marvin. Our final speaker, but not least, is Ms. Jamil Venturini, co-executive director of Derechos Digitalis. I hope I said that right. <laughs> Uh, your Excellencies, dear delegates, 
Dear colleagues, participants of this IGF, good morning. My name is Jamila Venturini. I live and I am from Brazil. And today I'm here as a representative of Derechos Digitales Latin America and on behalf of the Association for Progressive Communications, APC. For many of us, this is the first edition of the IGF that we attend in person after the pandemic effects hit us all in different ways. This IGF has the imprint of a re-encounter to continue shaping the governance of the internet to ensure that it contributes to the common good, to a just, equitable and sustainable digital future. The 17th edition of the IGF takes place in a moment when the exacerbated effects of overlapping global crises, such as the weakening of democracy, wars, climate change, among others, are felt strongly but differently in different contexts. Extrapolated to the digital sphere, those crises have translated into the intensification of polarizing and stigmatizing narratives, the magnified, pervasive and concentrated power of big corporations over the digital space, and the rising of new forms of digital and data colonialism and authoritarianism, just to mention a few. But what does this all mean for internet governance? In my view, it means the following key things. First, all these recent crises are created or exacerbated by structural inequalities and power imbalances, which we need to acknowledge as we develop discussions on internet governance. Technologies have the potential to exacerbate such imbalances and inequalities, and this became evident during the pandemic. When a small part of the global population could continue their activities safely and remotely, while another part continues to pay the price of being excluded. But can technology also play a role in mitigating such inequalities? The answer is yes, and we have several examples of that. However, for them to be sustainable and become the norm, we need to deeply review our priorities and find ways to make the best possible uses of the existing international processes. As power imbalances affect internet governance spaces as well, more proactive actions towards building effective multi-stakeholder processes and increasing broader participation on all digital cooperation and governance discussions are urgently needed. International organizations should set the example and include proactive measures to allow historically marginalized groups to have their voices heard and meaningfully considered. And this includes intergovernmental and standard setting and technical organizations, development agencies and banks, among several others, which should also build transparency and accountability mechanisms into their own processes and pressure national governments and global tech companies in the same direction. The IGF is a central piece of the internet governance ecosystem and key to improve the coordination in global internet governance and digital cooperation. We look forward to the role that the IGF leadership panel can play to consolidate the IGF as a platform for identifying viable ways to shape, sustain and strengthen generally democratic governance processes. One second point I want to bring to my initial question on the relationship between the multiple crises that affects us and this IGF is that the internet is embedded in people's lives and digitization impacts both those connected and the unconnected. The internet should serve to promote empowerment and agency of groups in situation of marginalization, not the contrary, and they should be able to participate actively in the decisions that are affecting their futures. For instance, the gaps in internet access continues to be a critical challenge in Africa and broadly throughout the global south greater effort can be placed in contextualizing connectivity in order for communities to fully benefit from it. Expanding the telecommunications ecosystems to include locally driven, community-oriented solutions can help to drive appropriate content, local innovation and community ownership, as well as economic change in many areas in Africa and elsewhere, as several leaders and grassroots organizations present here have already proved. They should be part of any discussion on internet government. Women and LGBT plus groups should also be part of any discussion on these matters. And they have already played a key role in building a resilient and sustainable digital future.
Concrete measures should be taken to foster their participation in digital cooperation and governance conversations and to protect their rights, including to life and freedom of expression. We are constantly under attack due to gender-based political violence against the ones who occupy decision-making spaces or to insist to raise their voices against injustices. Finally, I cannot stand here without echoing civil society's call for the reestablishment of internet access across the African region and beyond, and the promotion of a free, open and secure internet that allows us to fully exercise their fundamental rights. While we celebrate the existence of the IGF, itself a result of significant civil society pressure, we stress the need for it to play a leading role in fostering human rights, gender and environmental justice perspectives into digital cooperation and internet governance conversations towards the, towards the future that we want. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Venturini. Uh, I think that brings a close to our opening session. Uh, they, with the Ethiopian calendar, it is 2015, but it doesn't mean that they are behind times because we are ahead of time and we'll actually close for lunch early. Uh, just one um, reminder is that we do have a daily bulletin and there are some copies around and you can also access it through our website for the daily bulletin. Thank you all and thank you for attending. <laughs>